have to go get the questions. You've made me forget the questions. Don't knock my tea everywhere. Wait, just wait. Today is a Q&A, Bushcraft Q&A. So I'm gonna be doing my very best to answer your questions at home. As always, please hit the subscribe button. Let us know what you wanna see here on the channel. A little while ago, I asked a question on our community page. If you haven't already, check that out. These are some of the questions that you at home have sent in. Tilly would like to answer some too. Interestingly, we're gonna start off with one from the Single Track Woodsman, and he's asking, what is the best piece of advice that I've ever been given, what's stayed in my mind throughout and stayed the course shortly after my very rural childhood, okay, we're kind of talking late teens now, before I'd cemented in my mind and made the decision to go and become a British commando, I was working on a building site in construction, okay, so uh, I was a qualified bricklayer, okay, so the best piece of advice I was given came from a former uh, French Foreign Legionnaire who was a carpenter on the site. Now being a bricklayer, being part of the first fix or first phase of the building, um, we would then obviously hand over to second fix. And so I met this chap, he was a former British paratrooper who had got into a spot of bother and gone down to join the French Foreign Legion. He was about to leave to become a, he was gonna do something to do with joinery and construction timber cabins in Canada. So if you're watching this now, you inspired me. You gave me a piece of advice and what you said to me was, or a young former version of myself, it's the man on the ground that will always dictate. Don't be, don't allow yourself to be bullied into making decisions that sometimes are slightly blinded in the ops room or the overall command element doesn't have the full picture because only the man on the ground who, who who can see what's happening and about to play out in front of him. I guess the overall message there was very much trust your own gut, trust your instinct in this life. You'll have gone to meetings, you'll have had things happen in, you know, you'll have set out into the great outdoors, looked at the sky and gone, well, this wasn't on the weather report, but I think this is about to get hairy. Trust that gut instinct, you know, put those waterproofs on. Don't be afraid to put your hand up and ask a question if you, you're not quite sure because every single person is a link man. Everyone is as important as everybody else. So there you go, so that's kind of a big deep one to get to get us going. But uh, you know, the questions are the questions. Uh, we've all had those significant aha moments when light bulbs go in our head and things make sense. What was your most significant one? I think Tilly Moo getting, getting a little doggy could be quite a significant one. I didn't have a dog prior to uh, you know growing up and I didn't have a, a dog prior to me kind of becoming very unwell mentally. And it was actually suggested that I get a dog while I was still in the Navy, Navy Recovery Service Centre. Haven't looked back, best decision I ever made. It gave me a reason at the time to wake up on purpose, with a purpose. So I had to feed the dog, take the dog for a walk, let her go outside and have a poo and all that kind of stuff. The scientific results are there and are plain to be seen. You know, we know it lowers blood pre pressure. Having an animal companion is a, is a great thing. The only sad thing is we're destined to outlive them and they leave a big hole behind. She's just been an absolutely amazing companion. On your recent walk, you both agreed to bail. My question is that in different circumstances, clearly you could have carried on and paid the price we can get anything we want in life as long as we pay the price. Isn't that the truth? How long did it take to make that decision and realize it was going to be too expensive? I think myself and Carl were constantly assessing the situation. After every time one of us had taken a fall, in particular, a Carl slipped going down a bank and it kind of did a little roll and stuff like that, but was moaning about his hip quite a lot. You've got to remember that it looks soft uh, and the ground was wet, but it's just rock hard chalk underneath and you've got the weight of a Bergen on. So after every little niggle, we'd sort of have a discussion about it, see how we feel, which is the adult and mature thing to do. Just because you used to be a Royal Marine Commando, up there is still very much uh, the Carl, uh, the Carl I, I knew uh, through basic training and then the guy I've always known. But physically, if you have a desk job now and you're in charge of stuff and you're sitting back, maybe you're not getting out there as much. That's okay too. This is how we learn, this is how we grow. So one thing I can say, and I can speak for Carl, is that we'll be back. I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed every single minute, even the painful stuff. So I'd say it was a constant rolling assessment and we will be back. Do you have an opinion on an 
the Outdoor Axe, the Grands Fours Brooks, please. Is it worth the money before I buy? A fan of the channel and charity raising well done, you should be proud. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. Yes, I did a whole video where I absolutely covered axe and axe maintenance and axe care. Check out that video. I specifically covered uh, mainly, I think, our Grands Falls Brooks axes. So, and if you're asking me which one's my absolute favorite, I'm kind of torn between two because when it comes to craft stuff, it has to be the Swedish carving axe. When it comes to general use in the woods, it has to be the small forest axe. Okay, so this one says, hi Nick, what made you want to join the army? Technically I joined the Navy. And were you in the scouts when you were younger? No, I wasn't a scout and here's why. When I was younger, scouts in my village, the village scout hut was literally just down the road and it was a Thursday night that clashed with rugby. And at the time I was completely enamored with rugby. I was already in the early stages of dancing around, thinking about wanting to play for county. So I must've been about 12, 13, 14. So yeah, scouts, scouts never really took off for me. I was very fortunate to be just leaving the college squad as we had a we had a fantastic young man come into the team by the name of Mr. Joe Marler, who's fairly well known. It led me to making the astute decision to get a career in uh, and having a trade under my belt, which has proven 10 times and again to be very, very useful. Now getting into the military, as I said, I was working on the building site and it, it just didn't, it didn't click for me and I didn't have that same team element that I'd had with rugby. And I was really thinking about maybe the army or something like that. I had a cousin, my cousin James. James, if hello, if you're watching, you were very inspirational to me as a young man. My mum took me along to meet my cousin James, who was just leaving the Royal Marines. I was sold from the moment I walked into that farmhouse. There was a picture on a wall and it just had two black Chinook helicopters and a bunch of guys all in black. And for me, I was like, that looks like team. That that screams what I want to do. That looks like high performance team stuff. I suddenly needed to strip down and become an endurance based animal that could just go and go and go. So I set about that task and I dropped right the way down to about 12 stone 11. And then I went and did my uh, potential War Marines commando course where I met Carl for the first time at the recruitment office going through that process. Uh, we've been buddies ever since. So, um, so yeah, that's what led me into the Marines. And then I just Commando training was bloody hard. You've just got to, got to find that inner belief that you can get through the next stage and the next thing and never look any further ahead than the week that you're on. What would be the most challenging thing you had to overcome in bushcraft after leaving the forces and just how did you overcome it? The first thing I would say is I had to learn that the field is not the field. It's not constantly scanning for in-depth fighting positions. And every time you leave your hammock, scanning five meters to 20 meters away from you, constantly hypervigilant, looking for booby traps and where you're gonna get caught out, caught short. Always trying to overthink every situation, okay? What it is, is about embracing and letting nature into your heart. It's accepting that you're, you're part of a legacy of hundreds of thousands of years worth of humans who have survived and thrived in our outdoor landscape by practicing these skills. When you're under your own steam and making your own decisions and operating outside of that, by and large, what happens is completely down to you. There's no supply chain behind you. You've, you've got to think of everything and, and, and act on it. So yeah, one of the fastest things I had to learn was that the field is not the field uh, and that there is, there's a whole world of knowledge out there outside of the armed forces. What is the single piece of best piece of advice when you find yourself in the outdoors and the weather isn't playing nice? Right, and I've just written, is it safe? assess and cover. So first thing you'll ask yourself is, am I safe right now in the outdoors? And if the wind is howling and picking up and picking up, make an assessment of your instant surroundings. If you're in the middle of an open field, right there in that instant, I don't think you're gonna to come to too much harm. If it's thunderstorms and things like that, and lightning starts striking around the field, well then you're not in a good place, are you? But equally, let's say you're in a, in a woodland and you start getting all the high winds that we just had, what sort of canopy is around you? Do you know enough? Do you have enough knowledge, okay, because it weighs nothing, to know that the timber crop around you is by and large mostly a uh, very strong, sturdy understory, things like uh, hawthorn, blackthorn, and things like that, and less likely to be toppling over and coming to, you know, get you? Or are you in a pine woodland with relatively shallow rooted base plates and trees that are high canopy that will tip so it's, it's understanding 
the composition of the landscape around you and the, the, the likely best places to find good solid cover. For me, I would always think about actually the landscape itself. Things like the valleys and re-entrance, things like moving around to the other side of the hill or the mountain or dropping down a little bit of height or gaining a bit of height. It's just trying to find yourself a bit of somewhere you can you can set up a tarpaulin or get out of the wind or shelter using using a rocky outcrop or whatever it is. Always constantly be assessing and thinking safety first. Hi Nick, do you have any tips on engagement with children? Simple stuff we can do without spending a fortune. Yeah, I do. There's absolutely loads and loads and loads of stuff. You could go along to somewhere like, and I'm just thinking off the top of my head, somewhere like The Book Barn or your local library and pick up some books in your hand, actual physical books, okay, on animal track and sign, on reading the weather, clouds, etc., on all kinds of stuff and start to gen yourself up and get a good knowledge base going on the world around you. Get out there and practice. Go out there with the kids and say, who's left this track here, Tilly? Uh, it might be deer, it might be badger, it might be fox, okay, and learn why. And it's almost like a outdoor CSI who done it. You come across a situation, you find a pile of feathers. Now, was it something like an ambush predator, like a cat, or has a fox got hold of a pigeon? Or is it a bird strike and a bird of prey has hit it? So there's all this kind of stuff. There's information out there that you could be doing with the kids, playing nature detectives. The other one is if you can afford it or you have a tarpaulin, get out there and try setting it up in lots of different shapes, you know, like origami, uh, tarpology. Check out our vids on tarpology and you never know, you might come up with something new and then I can learn something as well. Let us know again in the comments box below. As an educator and wilderness instructor, what do you find the most rewarding part of what you do and is it the same rewards as when you first started in your role so i first started in my role crikey uh, i would probably say just under 10 years ago now so that's flown yes it is the same i get a real buzz when i get feedback from people who say i now look at the outdoors and the field is not just the field it's now food medicine craft items materials it's water, it's a place to relax, it's a place to chill, it's a place to calm my mind, it's a place where I can uh, take my family and share those skills, so there's that cascade of knowledge. It's a place where other people go and maybe maybe they've got a business that they could start to run outdoors. There are plenty of people now start, starting walking and talking counselling, where they're getting out there and they're going on walks with their clients rather than staying in the little room with the box of tissues. Getting out there every single day is, is a massive thing. And for me, it's just as rewarding today as it was the first time I ran a kid's birthday party and I saw all those little faces light up around the campfire. Or working with um, CEOs of large global brands and taking them away on expeditions, micro expeditions. It's always the same thing for me when I see somebody really enjoying what they're doing and learning and growing. It's the same thing. So it doesn't matter whether you're three or 103, I still get the same buzz out of teaching and, uh, and working in the outdoors in that way. Now this question is about the army bivvy. So this is about modifications on a military Bergen. I'm thinking of putting a heavy duty zip with a storm flap on my bivvy bag. That's a standard British military bivvy bag to make it easier getting in and out and also thinking of attaching a chest strap, okay, and more padding on the shoulder straps of my 120 litre Bergen. Let me go get one. The standard British military Bergen, okay, this is a slightly more recent one. It's pretty much the same design. Yes, it has a hip pad on here with a belt that goes around your waist, but very sadly, they don't come with a chest strap. And this is something that I think Carl really noticed on our South Downs way walk. So yeah, a simple strap across there, or probably lower down, because it wants to go from the, the kind of peak sort of halfway up the chest. Other than that, they're pretty bomb proof and I've got no qualms with them at all. There is of course the fact that you can only access this through the side and I would personally want to access it along the top. So it allows someone else to access it a, a little bit easier. What are some of the things newbies that are doing that should be avoided? 
Many people will know that whether you're using a Mora Companion or one of their kind of Craftsman range or one of these smaller types, there's so many different. This is the Mora Robust. They all come with these kind of clip handles. It's very tempting to want to just clip these outside your equipment like this. And this is kind of reinforced visually by social media platforms like Instagram, for instance, where I keep seeing packs, rate this pack out of 10, and I keep seeing these knives on show on the outside of the pack. So they're easily accessible, etc. This is all wonderful and fantastic until you put this into practice, certainly here in the UK, and you're walking along a bit of public footpath with your knife on show. Guys, just don't do it. I think the reason it's happening on Instagram and on that social media platform is because they have to visually depict, you know, the sorts of things that will be inside the pack. And so they try to try to have a lot of things on show. It's all about a composition and making a nice photograph and stuff like that. Generally, uh, not really the done thing. If you think about the etiquette of carrying a knife, you don't really want it on show. You don't want to be telegraphing to the world that you've got this knife. The other problem is sometimes, not always, but sometimes these can work their way free. Okay, you end up in this situation and for whatever reason, um, sometimes these spin. I've had them spin before. Uh, there's another type of one that you get with the Bushcraft Black, which articulates. So, um, you know, you're more likely to lose it. Shall we go for a walk? <laughs> she's, she's desperate to go, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, as always, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yes, we're going. Please hit the like, share, subscribe button, and I'm gonna take Tilly Move for a walk, and I'll see you guys again soon.